Hi, Chris. First of all, welcome, Sebastian. Now, we got to ask, does anybody here not know what this is? Anybody here never heard of this company before? Doesn't okay. look like, huh? Good. I, I, was, I was just, just, just testing. Coca-Cola, I think, is uh, some, so a company everybody knows. And uh, Coca-Cola um, European Partners is also a partner of yours, right? Exactly. So we started uh, with Coca-Cola European Partners um, almost a year ago. Uh, and we had a very interesting approach with them because we looked into an IoT challenge they have. Okay. So, and that's what it is about with MindSphere, looking into challenges and solve them with MindSphere. Exactly. And MindSphere, I just um, kind of briefly kind of described uh, what it is, if you can do this better. But um, I just read or saw, I don't know if you've seen it yet, this article in the FATS, the Frankfurter Allgemeinen Zeitung, a huge article about MindSphere. And the, the crazy thing is, you guys started only three years ago, four years ago? So it was actually the first time here in Hanover three years ago, 2016, when we introduced MindSphere on a three by three meter square meter booth. Right. So and now you have a how many square meter huge uh, 800, I think it is about 800. And if I remember when we stood here for the first time, we introduced only like three, four use cases. It's hundreds of them now. So it's overwhelming what happened in the last three years. Of course, we know size doesn't matter, right? It's all about <laughs> what, <laughs> what you find inside. But um, basically, you can uh, now um, tell us a bit about what we're going to see here on stage in the next couple of moments, together with your partner. Exactly. So we will look now into the IoT challenge we, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we implemented with uh, Coca-Cola. It's an interesting case because it shows really how I, uh, I would say all industry have to think about digitalization. And we've been hearing about chicken, poultry yesterday, and mm -hmm. fish, connected mm -hmm. fish. Mm -hmm. So taste as a service concept. And today we will be hearing about Coca-Cola, how they use Mindsy in their environment to improve their um, filling lines. Well, then let's get them on stage. What do you say? Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from Coca-Cola European Partners, Deutschland GmbH. Here is Damo Vishwanath. Welcome, Damo. From Siemens, Jana Saalfeld. And also from Mindsphere, here is Klaus Kremers. So, welcome everybody. I'm going to leave it up to you, Sebastian. Thanks a lot, Chris. And um, yeah, let's see we if we can find some more colas. <laughs> <laughs> so, First of all, it's super exciting to be here, Damo, Jana. So that was kind of an exciting journey over the last few weeks with you guys. So I'm very interested about what we will be hearing from you in a few minutes. But before we go into the challenge and talk about the first results, Damo, how and why did you join this challenge and why did you work with us? Um, I think it has something to do with our company philosophy. We believe in what we call a growth mindset. You grow when you share and it's, 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 it's about plugging the holes in a boat. If uh, we are in an industry which is challenged because we use a lot of plastic, uh, we, we, we produce a lot of waste, but we also have a product that's extremely well-liked, so we can't just stop doing what we do. And we need to find ways, uh, not just us as a company, but others who are with us in the boat, to find ways to get better at what we do, having a lesser uh, safer environmental impact and that means we look at everything we do and try to improve the process and we try to also look for digital leapfrogging for possibilities to go from a candle to a bulb eventually and not necessarily by continuous improvement and getting to know the Mindsphere challenge was a good introduction to combine two of our needs to bring our people into the digital age and to understand what's out there in the market that might be a a potential future capability for, for Coke, for the supply chain, for our manufacturing areas. Okay, sounds really cool. Klaus, so you're our digitalization guy and you do it by heart, right? I mean, you're yes. a big fan of digitalization. Why do you think it's so exciting to work here with Coca-Cola on this topic? So um, for me, as, uh, as I'm doing lots of stuff within Mindsphere, this kind of work with the customer is, uh, from my perspective, is the future of, uh, of how we work with the customers. I brought some, some, some impulses here just to, to mention out, to point out some stuff we also do. Maybe uh, let's talk a little about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So first of all, everything we do leads to follow a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. So here to define a challenge with the customer is the first thing we have to do. This is what we do when we call co-ideation and co-creation already. Mm -hmm. So we start with the customer working together jointly, but always open. And in the code case, it was really funny because we then made it more open as well, went to an extra event where lots of startups, I think we see some pictures later, worked on the challenge. So this is one, one thing we do with customers. So and what I really like about this case is also, uh, and therefore we have Jana here with us, mm -hmm. it's a slightly different approach this time because um, we used a lot of, let's say, co-creation um, activities to you know, define the solution with our customers, mm -hmm. but also with external developers. In this case, we have Jana here, and Jana is a Siemens developer working on application for customers. And I think that's great because you can see, really see we have third parties, we have our own people, we have the customers. So the ecosystem, from my point of view, is constantly growing, and it's growing fast, and everyone can participate yes. in there. And that's what we maybe do with some other events. Yep. We do meetups, for example, where people can meet the customers with their challenges, discussing directly with, with partners that we have already, but also startups are invited. The next meetup, for example, is just taking place next week in Chemnitz. So, so hold on, locally. Klaus, what is a meetup? Oh, yeah, good question. So um, meetup is something we, we, we took from the startup scene a little bit and bring, brought into the industry. Uh, startups with a good idea have five minutes to pitch the idea and match make with our customers. So we invite customers and our partners and developers to talk together, to discuss openly. So when I first participated in such a meetup or such a challenge, I was really impressed about the speed. So you go in such a meeting, you discuss the problem, you have a prototype within a couple of hours, and then after two days, three days, you have almost a ready-to-use solution, Jana. That's crazy, right? Yes, it is, of course. But it, this is the power of these meetups, just to develop the solutions very, very quickly and to, to see the benefit of a solution within a short amount of time. OK. Yeah. So close, what else we have? Um, so um, here you find something. It's called continued learning. So we try to support our customers and the developer scene with lots of, uh, of new formats that they learn all the stuff that we also have to learn because our team is developing an agile model. So every two weeks, there's new features and functions. So we have to learn and the developers. And therefore, for example, we had the developer days, first of its kind last year in Berlin, underground style, whatever the developers need to get uh, confident with the, with the stuff. And there we had lots of discussions. Amazing, um, amazing thing. I don't know, is there something planned like this, Sebastian? So we're planning a next one, but uh, it will be released soon. Ah, OK. <coughs> okay. So Maybe just one comment here, because you just mentioned the continued learning. We had Bader here yesterday, together with uh, Evonik. And I also really like the approach there that uh, Bader came to us and said, look, we want to build up uh, knowledge and capability in our own company. And we want to really closely work with you to um, yeah, teach, basically, their apprentice uh, uh, in their apprenticeships, people already uh, from the very first hour it's the, of their business life on Mindsphere. So I think that also really nicely shows how such an ecosystem and the network in an ecosystem like this can really build uh, the foundation. Okay, cool. Klaus, anything else that you would like to add? Because I'm getting really get excited now. To yeah, hear from yeah of course, everybody is waking for the Coke story. But um, I want to invite you up front to, to join us to do some, some kind of challenges also with us. That's the little marketing part that I have to bring. Come to us, speak to us. We will be up there as well discussing the stories. And we also have some other stories down here in the automotive area where we, uh, we brought up the fast ramp up challenge, something very new. So talk to us about this stuff. And you will learn a lot about how we can work together. So, Damo, over to you. Thanks, Klaus. After one year now, we are like a little <laughs> bit closer together <laughs> sitting here. Yeah. But I think it was a long way. Let's yep. hear what happened. Yeah, I giving credit where credit is due. I think it all started off in the last Hanover Fair. Yes. One of my colleagues, she isn't here today because she's in another meeting. We are basically splitting ourselves across. Christina Drenkert. Yes. She was on the stage last year looking for answers to some of our biggest issues which we had and that Damo, one was Damo, we have to mention one guy because i see him there spotting there so coca-cola is, is of course like uh, a big customer of us and the people who know the customer best are our sales people so they 
introduced us, and so there at everything started. Fair so enough. You can raise your hand a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there are more. At Coca-Cola, we believe sales is important because unless you know what, unless the customer knows what they are looking for, you don't get to move product. You can't feed the people who make the product, and therefore. Um, that's something that's important. What else is important? We call it the front line. Are the people who touch the product that finally lands in the customer's hand. These products need to be absolutely on, on quality levels that are, that are across the world. Anywhere in the world, when you buy a Coke, you know that the water that comes in it has a minimum standard. And even in cities where the, the tap water is drinkable, we still have to process it. I used to be a plant manager, so I can tell you this is an important part of what we do. And these are becoming more and more hygiene constraints. Uh, we'll go into a bit of why before I move on to the interesting bit. So bear with me. Uh, for those of you who are from food and beverage or the OEM manufacturers, the ones who make machines for us, we brought along some of the why slides as to why it is important for us to have digital transformation in the first place. And I think Many of you are in the same boat. We have incoming expectations from customers, from market, from shareholders. We have internal limitations as to what we can ask our people to do, what we are able to get them to work in terms of hours, what we are able to pay in order to be able to deliver that bottle to a shop somewhere in a corner of, of a village. And then you have other influence factors, like, for example, the raw materials that go into making Coke come from across the world. The sugar, the water is always sourced locally, but some of the concentrates, some of the aromas that come in, they come from across the world. Any crisis across the world means that there are several people working across the industry trying to make sure that you get your Coke in that same quality. And all of those things that happen behind the background, every time that becomes tougher, that circle becomes more and more tough to keep in that same way. Which means we looked at three focus areas which we could work on on the short term, using digital technology to, as I call it, leapfrog. And uh, the three areas which we look at currently, and we said we share this because we think we want feedback from you guys as to what you, what you think of them, whether we can do better, whether you have tried different stuff, and if you haven't tried the same stuff, if you want to go along on the journey. The first one, obviously, is, is the custom experience. Um, most of our products are now moving across online channels just as much as you get them in retail. And there are a lot of people who take care of the fact that the way you get a Coke served with a nice in a particular glass is something that's part of our, of our product standard. That is something we try to technologically make it possible. So you have people, Coke salesmen who are out in the field who take a picture of a cooler and be able to tell you if you're hitting our numbers properly or not, if the bottles are in the right place, if they're facing front, if the customer is always getting a chilled bottle, stuff like that. Those are basics, but we're trying to use digital technology to make the job for the guy who goes around easier. Then it's also moving from the traditional supply chain to a more agile supply chain. We know that having Chris come in earlier and show you the bottle would have made at least three out of 10 sitting here thirsty. <laughs> Which means if my colleagues have done their jobs well, after this meeting, you're able to get a bottle of Coke or a drink right off the bat. And that's, that's called creating the demand and then being able to serve it. And, and this is where we are trying to move the supply chain onto. And that is a lot about moving um, into demands signal, getting the demand signal early on, and then using advertising, using weather data in order to make the right predictions so that the people can make the right product. And then the most important factor, where Siemens comes into play. The way you guys like Coke, our OEM seem, seem to like Siemens machines and PLCs. So obviously we have a lot of Siemens machines sitting in our lines. And then we looked at, at MindSphere as a solution provider for this part, which is, as I called it earlier, the front line. The front line are the people who are either having an interface with the customer, who are touching the customer, or touching the product which comes up in the hands of the customer in the end. And these are the shop flow people, and that's what we're going to take for today's case. We just want to look at an example of something we developed well under one year, and that's already helping us to turn around the way we do our work in the factories, at least in one factory where this has already been piloted. Now we'll go into the 
interesting part before we go on to an <laughs> actual lab demonstration because we said the proof lies in the pudding, you need to see the stuff, how it works. For some of you, it might be a technically uh, well-known. I mean, the food and beverage guys, this part is going to be boring, but then Yana's part will be interesting. But bear with me for the other people who haven't, who wouldn't know how this goes. Uh, basically, what you have in every Coke factory, and there are 16 of them in Germany, and this is, although Coke is seen in Germany as an, as an American software drink, yes, we do have a headquarters uh, back in the US, for the, the bottlers are usually local. In Germany, we are the bottling company with the most number of factories closest to every city. So we have, we have 16 factories across Germany, and the target of having so many is to have the shortest distance to deliver it to the customer. That's our way of making an ecological impact. Our fastest growing sortiment uh, product are glass bottles. Works in Germany because we also have a return system that makes it easy. We are trying to get this into other European countries and across the world. Our target is to by 2030 halve the amount of plastic we are bringing out of our factories. That also means when we look at the world, way the product flows, one of our biggest ways of having impact is to make sure that the lines run well. I think for some of you who have been sitting here long enough, the guy before me has talked enough about root cause analysis. We'll be looking at one of them. But the challenges which the workers face, you have four different people here in, in the slide. They are the production engineer, the guy who takes care of the line. You have the designer who makes sure that the right product goes in, does the plan for what's coming up next. Then you have the people who are basically uh, the, the demand planners who say what product needs to be produced by when and what amounts. And then you have the people who need to track the numbers. These are usually the controllers who make sure that, uh, that the financial aspects of, of the business are still on, 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 the, on the positive side. All of these people work with a huge amount of data and all of our machines are creating data in the background. Some of it, it just goes off. We make decisions on the spot to decide whether the product continues to get produced or stop it or whether we change a label or we don't change a label. Much of that data never gets stored. When we talk about storage, we talk about collaboration systems. We have SAP, uh, we have Terra data for forecasting. We have a whole bunch of systems. We have a um, quality system, LIMPS, and we have a whole plethora of different systems which brought in, which are good at each of the things they need to do. But we still, when a worker goes in and wants to look at a bottle, look at the tracking code, and decide where, from which farmer did that sugar come, he needs to go through three systems before he can track and trace the origins of the materials on that bottle. And we want to make it easier, in case of a quality issue, to be able to find out what might be a potential problem. And then we, we have a, what we call a loosely integrated system landscape. Some of the guys who have been working with me last week know this. We have been switching email addresses. It's had its own bunch of problems. And then every manufacturing guy here in the audience knows this. Our biggest challenge is to get into proactive work, proactive maintenance, proactive procurement, and then getting our shop floor people to be proactive in order to, I think there are some very good examples upstairs of condition monitoring using machine data to predict before issues turn up on machines. That's something we also look at. And then our biggest problem, we have huge amounts of data. Everybody tells us this is liquid gold but we have no idea how to store, sort, and use this. And therefore, most of the knowledge which we have is in silos. Also not a new issue for manufacturing people, but it bears repeating. So, we, so what we actually did as part of the MindSphere open space challenge was to go out, find some young people, bring them together. We actually went to the technical university in Munich. That was Klaus, that was Christina. We had some help. And then we basically took them to a factory. Uh, we went to the Munich plant, was the closest, and had discussions with the shop floor people as to what are the things that move them. How can we make the life easier for them? How can we get digital technologies to speed up this transfer of data? And then we came up with four areas where we thought good progress could be made with digital tools. Uh, those are the four. One was a control cockpit, something where you can look at live and see where are the issues that are happening. A knowledge base, being able to go back to what has been fixed in the past and use it for future issues. Have mobile inspections, don't have to go back to a terminal somewhere in a corner and having to enter data, being able to have that in your hand. 
and being able to um, do your inspections. And then of course collaboration. Today when an issue happens on the line, we usually resort to using WhatsApp. Five months down the line, if somebody wanted to know what happened, on that day in that place, they end up having to look through histories. We wanted to have it in one system. And uh, those are the questions with which we went to a group of people, university students, some partners who helped us create the event, and some of the programmers Damo, from um, Damo, Siemens. Uh, let me just point out this, because I think this is important part. Mm -hmm. So we did something that was never done before. We brought like, how many applied for the chance? Like 30 young people, they formed teams out of nothing, mm -hmm. and we brought them to the factory, and they were so surprised, oh, everything's already digitized. But the kind of how the people use, how, the, how your workers use the digitalization, that was very, um, that had to be discussed. So they learned a lot, and now um, it comes to the, to the point where they get creative and then develop such ideas, right? Absolutely. I mean, <coughs> um, we, have, we have a video of how we try to get to production superheroes. I'll, I'll let it run, but I'll give you some, some, some background before we go into an actual proof of pudding. Um, this is what happened at the TU Munich. We actually had, you'll see Christina there and Klaus. They yes. basically went together, got 30 teams. That was the largest number of teams that actually participated in one single challenge from one single provider. And they took what they saw on the shop floor into Mindsphere. And I think some of them actually did sleep those two nights. Uh, yeah. And within a span of three days, they brought in surprising solutions. Solutions which we wouldn't have thought possible in that short time. And solutions, some of them very similar to what we have spent a year getting to. And so uh, it, was a, it was a good opportunity for us to learn that sometimes it's worth going outside your comfort zone, going outside your company to look at solutions. And it also made us open to possibilities where we could actually look at other partners and other this, than... Yeah, this, this kind of event is just it's, it's an event, okay? But what you need to do is to prepare the event perfectly. So what we did is... We actually got data, for, so we, we went to the Fort Knox, got data already ready to use out of your plant into the Mindsphere tenant, yeah? so the people could use already data, and that was something we really had as a success factor, because if you give developer data, they start working. If you give developer PowerPoint, they start to go to fall asleep. So we really um, got the data yep. from the Fort Knox. It was tough with the legal department, but we managed to do it. And then you see here some people that, um, that really started to, to code in, 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 two we in two days yep. actually come out with the ideas. Yeah. And also um, here you see a colleague of mine. It is also for us a new way of working together. Mm -hmm. So we also took part. And me, myself, I slept in a, uh, in a gym together with the developers. It was really funny. Um, because you, you saw like 3 o'clock in the night, you saw people coming in. Hey, I got to sleep a little bit. And then... Um, and they, they stood up and, and, and went working again just to make the, uh, the customer happy. So really interesting part. So let me, let me ask the audience here. Any one of you participated in such an open space challenge hackathon? <laughs> just raise your hands. <laughs> it's very few. I mean, I'm actually a little surprised. Who but wants, to be, who wants to, to be in an open space challenge? Who wants to be young again and be <laughs> get creative? Come on. <laughs> so there's okay, at okay. least a few more hands. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Jana, maybe, uh, maybe you or Damo. So that makes really a lot of fun. I mean, you can see it from the pictures. And as Klaus said, it's a completely new style of working. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that the industry kind of need to adapt to. Yep. But it's, as you said, it's, it's not stoppable anymore, right? So yep. this change yep. is happening. And you either jump on this train and you benefit from it right away, mm -hmm. or you miss the train. Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the future is a shared future. It's a collaborative future. So there is no going away from what some of the startups have brought to the scene. The, the, the demand to deliver fast solutions, the demand for progress over perfection, that's something that's coming in from the market and we all need to deliver, which also means we need to adapt. I mean, both Coke and Siemens are companies that have been around for more than 100 years. We wouldn't be around another, for another 100 years unless we can adapt. And, and that's a reality for everybody in, in the field. And therefore, I'd recommend everybody to at least, if not, if, if not actually partake, at least join and observe such an event because you learn a lot. I think it's, it's not about just the young energy that's in the room. 
it's also about how asking people who haven't been on a shop floor, who haven't what the Germans call Betriebsblind, people who have been doing something for a long time, they get tunnel tracked, they don't see other potential solutions. Such opportunities are great ways to look at new ways of doing stuff. Fire up innovation, there are lots of other methods of doing this. And um, um, I, won't, I won't stick to the process so much, but except give a very clear recommendation. Anybody looking to move solutions beyond the known space, going outside the, the box, would need to actually have participated in one of those before you understand what goes into making something like that successful. But we promised proof of pudding, so <laughs> we'll get to that without further ado. Again, for the, for the bottlers or the beverage producers or the original equipment manufacturers who supply our industry, this is nothing new. But one of the, the continuous improvement process which we run is what we call a root cause analysis. In German, in Coke, we call it a problem losing story, a PLS, and uh, translates roughly to problem solving stories in, in English. The whole idea behind making, giving it such a name is to make it accessible to shop floor people. So if you take people who have had only high school training and then talk to them about root cause analysis in very technical terms or even Japanese terms, you lose them. So we try to make, keep it simple. We try to make the language accessible, which means the root cause analysis in Coke are called PLSs, a problem losing story. And when you have an issue, the people ask you, have you done a problem losing story for something similar in the past? <laughs> and that's, that's what we look for. And we found that once we started doing problem losing stories in the MindSphere app, which we had developed, we found added benefits which didn't have in our original scope. There was not scope grip, it was added benefit which came up later because we found if you have a number of problem losing stories on the same issue, you have a good tracking of how, what you have been doing and what you have been changing. We are going to look for Yana's example at a particular case of something known as a label applicator. That's, uh, as I said, for the non-industry people. That's the thing that applies this label. And the trick here is to not use too much glue because if you have too much glue, it sprays around. The picture looks something like that. Too much glue is not a good thing. Also, you need to wash it off when it goes into, uh, into the washing machine when the bottle gets recycled. And the other thing is if, if you have too little glue, the thing comes off before it gets to the customer. So both are not acceptable. We have sensors like measuring the temperature of the glue or weighing how much glue goes through. But we're going to look at one case where we try to see how the shop floor people try to get in, think through what was happening and find a solution, how those things stay on with the right amount of glue for the future. Seems like a simple problem, but the way you do it depends on... And uh, as I said, it's always interesting when you work with different groups and it was good of Siemens to get somebody from the development team because you get a chance to understand how shop floor people think and then design something with them, for them, that they now happily use. We are looking to scale up the solution. And what Yana will show now is something that is basically open source in MindSphere. It's not something that Coke owns. It's something we have basically said that stays open. Anybody can pick it up, use it, improve it, and uh, make, our, make your process, our process, much, that much better. Yeah. yeah, and Damu, this is exactly the point, the last point you mentioned, the yeah. shop floor people. So the most important thing during the whole POC we, we had, starting in September, going until December, was talking to the people in the plant, yeah. the people who want to work and need to work with the application all the time and all the day. Yeah. And this was the most important part, talking to the people, getting their pain points, getting their requirements, and to understand how they work. Because yeah. we are already living in a digital world, but uh, the shop floor worker maybe have a hard time to switch from a paper-based solution to a digital solution. Exactly. Yeah. No, absolutely. So some of the biggest hurdles in digital transformation is getting people to understand it's, it's not something that's replacing them, it's just improving the quality of their work, freeing them up from mundane, tedious stuff like looking up through papers to find old PLSs on the subject, to basically searching for it and then be able to spend more time on solving the problem better next time around. So to get a better understanding how they work and how they created PLS, they, um, if a problem occurs on the plant, it can be a problem related to machine or to the bottle labeler. Um, they're sitting together in the room like four to five people from uh, different areas. So the shop floor worker, maintenance guy, 
and some more people, yeah. and they brainstorm about it. They describe what's the problem, they try to find causes for the problem, and try to find solution based on that. And all these steps are done on a sheet of paper. Yeah. Yeah. So we call it an A3 sheet. Some of you would know this. This is a large sheet of paper in which you actually draw a fishbone diagram and you basically put man, machine, materials, etc. And you basically go through each of the potential factors and try to find out what might have gone wrong and how could you do it differently. And the, the big value add obviously now is in the past it has always been machine and some assumptions you made about what, what's happening on the machine. And you wouldn't see it again until the malfunction happened again. The step up by having uh, the Siemens MindSphere is you can actually get real machine data into that machine part and be able to look at it. So you don't have to wait for the next problem to happen. You can actually look at the data and define thresholds where you say this is the proper running of the equipment. Anything above and below is bad news. It needs to get looked at. Exactly. And to go more into details, what are the benefits of our solution? Um, what we want to reach was reduce the root cause analysis time. So we want to reduce the time to identify a problem and solve the problem. And the methods we tried to use for that was, on the one hand, knowledge sharing, because the knowledge is within the plant. All the shop floor workers have uh, extremely high knowledge about the processes and the machines, so we need their knowledge. Absolutely. The second point was sharing also existing PLS or existing solutions across different plants. If you imagine you have a bottling plant, you have multiple bottling plants, mm -hmm. um, you can imagine that the problems occur on, on this every plant and yep. maybe yep. the same problem occurs on a second plant mm -hmm. and it's easier to find a solution if you have a bunch of data available yep. to solve your issue more faster than every, uh, if every uh, plant would do this on its own. And um, we want to share the experiences across all the plants. Another thing we want to reach was uh, the connection between the uh, PLS and the PLS knowledge itself and the machine data. So at the moment, we had only uh, the PLS paper, yep. but we have no proof that, is something, that there is something related to machine data. So we want to connect the PLS to the machine data exactly. in order to prove that assumptions are correct yep. or not. And the second step is to identify problems automatically before they happen, before they happen or if they happen, yep. to provide solutions to the worker as soon as the problem happens yep. and not uh, that the worker has to follow a certain process. It haven't to search for PLS, for existing PLS, and yep. so on. Absolutely. The worker should uh, pr have a solution in place already as soon as the problem appears. Um, we implemented this with a small uh, POC app. We started in September and finished awesome. it in December. We worked in a very agile mode yep. with that. And uh, we, had some, we had three major sprints to implement that. And uh, the first uh, PLS has been created, I think, in October. Yep. And until now, we have 24 PLS created in the system. So, Jana, just one question. Because, so you started to code, and four weeks later, a worker started to use yep. the app already. Exactly. So four weeks after all the process, ideation, four weeks later, you have data and start to use the app. So yep. this is something that we have to point out, I think. So yep. before we see actually later the, the, the app, which is maybe not the shiny one, yeah, but it's something you can use, something that that's helps somebody because it's worked together with people and that's already in place then. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but that's also the, uh, the cool thing I think about software. You can make it shiny and uh, beautiful within hours well, I think, if you I want. think it was less about shiny. It was about how useful it is. Exactly. So much of the work which Jana did and we had um, John coming in with industry expertise to help out was to make sure that the workers can actually use it because it's a lot for people to give up one piece of paper which they've been using for more than 15 years and start doing it on a computer. It, it, it's, it's a big digital divide which they need to jump across. And 
the I really like that statement, by the way, because it's really about the purpose, right? Yeah. It's about the purpose, the purpose, the purpose. Yeah. This is what helps. Yeah. I fully agree. It doesn't yeah, have it to be shiny the, as long the, as it works. The first five PLSs was a lot of guided PLSs where you had people from Siemens helping out and saying, this is what you want to look at. But after they got to the critical mass, when they had the first 10 in, it was easier for them to say, no, let's do it in the system because we can search for similar stuff or we can look at machine data. Let's not keep it in two systems. And so in, in FFP, we don't talk about paper-based root cost analysis anymore. It's, it's directly in the system. It's easier and exactly as you said, the mind sphere and the access, to the library makes it very easy to put something together. Once you have the ideas to put them together into, into a functioning app is, is easy. And another point we, we find out when we were at Furstenfeld Brook was that um, the task handling was quite difficult for the shift supervisor. Yep. So out of these PLS, uh, we have several tasks which has been completed by the workers to solve the PLS. Mm -hmm. But these tasks are only written down on the A3 sheet. So the supervisor has no idea and has no chance to track these tasks. Yep. So this was one of the major points within the app where we also need to implement some kind of task, uh, handling task overview yep. so that every worker on his own or own can uh, check, are there open tasks I have to fulfill until a certain date? Yep. So task handling was uh, one of the major purposes we implemented here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the digital representation of the PLS itself. We have also the option to create a small report. Mm -hmm. So this is um, especially important for the supervisor um, to get a report about open task of the team, for yeah. example, or to know if uh, someone of, of the team has uh, uh, outstanding tasks and needs more time for that. Yeah. It's also something about how to organize the work exactly. for the team members. Mm -hmm. And you can s share these solutions on that. Mm -hmm. Jana, did you bring the example with you? or? Do you have the app uh, with you? Yeah, of course, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we see it on the next slide. So what you can see right here is uh, just in the overview. And uh, what we have, what we did already was we connected one line in First and Third Brook mm -hmm. uh, with uh, five machines uh, connected. So it was the blow motor yep. and the filler. Um, these were the major machines where we had the most data. But we also connected the pelletizer and the ATMA for yep. example. What you can see right here is a list of already created PLS. And um, we will start the video right now where you can see how the PLS is created. Um, the PLS is created based on the problem Damu already described. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we also implemented is um, an as assistant. Because yep. what we all also experience in Furstenfeld Brook is that the quality of a PLS yep. mainly depends on the people who are sitting there together in the room exactly. um, and filling out the PLS. And uh, our goal was to have the same quality for every worker who creates a PLS. And to solve this problem or to solve this issue, exactly. uh, we uh, created a question and answer dialogue. So this dialogue has been elaborated, so the questions and answers has been elaborated with the subject matter experts in Fürstenfeld mm -hmm. This is configurable, so they can also change it if they not notice that there is an issue or something is missing, they can change it on their own. And uh, so they have some kind of um, a guided process for creating these PLS. In general, PLS consists of uh, different steps. As mentioned before, we have the description of the problem. We have uh, the identification of different causes. We have the um, next steps, so the solution. And we also have uh, future steps uh, we will see right now. And you can also add photos to describe the problem in a little bit more detailed, mm -hmm. just to visualize um, the issue. After we created the, um, uh, the problem description, the second step, and this is which is the, the valuable step yep. <laughs> in, the, in the process, is identifying the different causes. So Within that, all the people in the room are brainstormed together and everyone expresses their opinion what could be a possible cause for an issue. And all of this is written down and uh, also rated. So in the past, they have uh, these small dots yep. they used for, for their Voting. rating. Yep. 
And now we have this in a, a digital manner. So we have uh, a little star, so everyone can um, click on the star and can vote for their uh, favorite solution. And um, the most rated points um, will be taken to the next step. Yeah. So, so I think it's also about, uh, it, part of it is humanizing it by making the assistant. We usually used to have something known as a process coach who used to make sure that the quality of PLSs are equal. That assistant frees this person up now to go into the detail of what, what's being done. And also making voting systems democratic makes it far more easier to make sure that the, the enough, if, if, if people are being silent in the room, if they have process expertise and they haven't got around to putting out their word, that's their opportunity to raise their hand and say, there's another point which you might have missed. You want to take a look at that. And I think... This the, the biggest value is actually the being, able to, part. Exactly, <laughs> being able to drill it down to a machine and look at the machine data. Yeah. Exactly, and this is what comes in next. Is, um, we want to add some data to the PLS because we know we have a problem with the clue consumption and we want to prove that there is really a problem. So we uh, have a look at the line and the first step in the line is a the blowing of the of the bottles, and uh, in that case we have a unit counter which just counts numbers of bottles, and so we we identify the um, the time when the problem occurs, and then we had a look on the data, and uh, the first we saw was the blow motor, so the number of units were constantly increasing, mm -hmm. so it seems like everything is working good. This is the same for the filler, mm -hmm. and we also check the pressure of the filler right here. And this used to be data in the past. You would need to wait for the next failure to occur before you could, you could check your assumptions. Now you can actually go back to when it happened and look at all the data streams. This is an example. I know for those of you who are familiar with this, you would want to, me and Jana to talk about it for the next half an hour. And I know for the, those of you who are not familiar with this, this is probably all new stuff. So we are not going to go into <laughs> very specific details on those. But uh, exactly, that, that would we are getting into solutions. But we would be available after the session to be able to pick up any questions you have, so. But, but Jana, just to mention one thing, because I think the audience needs to know this as well. So in the app development is the one point, mm -hmm. but also connecting the whole plant mm -hmm. where the data comes from. So the connection of a, of a filling line is something we did also in the timeline. Yeah. So first getting the data, connecting plug and play, I would say, a little bit of configuration, and then you get the data, and you can use the data for the PLS. So this is okay. also part of, of the project, and that's the value of MindSphere as well. Exactly. So having the data yep. on time there. That bears mentioning. The line which, on which this was done is a 17-year-old line. So we're talking about backward compatibility here. And in that same time where the app was being developed, you could actually install a gateway and have all that data available. We're not talking about the most modern lines because OEMs often supply solutions to them. This was a very old line which we retrofitted and it, we're still able to get those, those numbers out of them. And very fast. Yeah. So yeah. Build, building up the gateway so was the hardest part, I think. <laughs> <laughs> True. So one addition to, to our use case, what you can see right here is now that the pelletizer has an issue. So we can see that there is a, the curve is not constantly increasing. So maybe there was an issue during uh, our process in the line. And this can be proved by using the machine data. So let's go to the next step. It's about uh, creating the tasks. So out of the solution, which, had been, which has been overtaken from the step before, we can create um, tasks right here. So you can uh, add a description, you can assign it to a person, you can provide a due date, so it's very simple. And uh, you can also have some kind of uh, costs and benefits um, mm -hmm. assumption, what it might be. Exactly. And um, I would just continue to the next, because we can see here is just another task which has been created. And um, in the end, and this is um, really a process which is, all, is, is um, mm -hmm. done at the end. So if all tasks has been fulfilled, um, there is a check, has the problem been solved or not? Mm -hmm. And if not, uh, the worker is uh, enforced to do the PLS again or to enrich the data. 
um, to find another solution. We can also add comments and some kind of history, especially if the shift, owner, uh, shift supervisor um, has comments on the PLS. Maybe he's not part of the PLS team, no. but um, he or she can have comments or ideas. He or she can add it here. And the last step is saving the PLS. So it's, it's, it's basically gone from being a machine data to, uh, to uh, actually task tracking, tracking tool, something which we didn't expect when we started off with the solution. And I think um, that was the question Sebastian and Klaus asked me. Uh, what's what's going to be the next? What are we doing next? And what would be our advice? Now looking from our experience in Fustenfeldbruck, doing this, what would be our advice for partners in in, in, in interested in, in, in moving this forward. And I think uh, it comes back to what we said in the very beginning. Uh, it's about keeping an open growth mindset attitude to the whole thing, believing that there's enough out there in the market, there are enough people to be served, there are enough products to be made, there is enough money to be earned. And the things we need to take care of are things like th we have this one planet and that, that, that needs uh, different ways of approaching problems. One of them is efficiency, one of them is uh, leapfrogging. And we think that the mind sphere, the opportunity to have um, open source apps that can be used across the industry is a great opportunity and, and, and mind sphere does an excellent job of this. We have looked at mind sphere in that one plant and we have found it exceedingly easy to use and easy to scale. And of course, for any digital transformation, we always say you need to pick the put the people first. It's not about the technology, it's about taking your, we, in CC, in Coca-Cola European Partners in Europe, we have 24,000 people. They need to move with the changes we have. So the digital transformation is also about making a new workplace in which people want to work in the future. There are people who are coming in from the universities right now, they do not want to work with potentiometers, they want to be able to work with a touch screen and they think differently about problems. That's something we need to prepare ourselves for. And uh, we see a huge opportunity in the fact that Siemens and Mendix have put themselves together because we have, as I said, most of these 24,000 people are 30 plus. There are people like me who finished school before computers got around or email got around and therefore low code programming, the potential to be able to have solutions, to be able to use machine data without necessarily being able to learn C++ is a huge advantage. It's, it's a game changer and I think uh, that collaboration has huge potential to put people first and we at Coke would be looking with our OEMs to use some of those opportunities. Amazing. So thanks for mentioning this, Damo. I think this Mendix integration is a really important step. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, when I was first introduced to this technology, I really understood the, the way in playing Lego, yep. putting little Lego stones on each other and build a house, for instance. So is, is it as simple as that? I think it's actually easier because the first time you put Lego stones together, they're difficult to figure out how they come together if you have two different Lego Duplo sets. And I think Mendix just has a very visual platform. You can, you can even simplify it to your needs. You can constrain the libraries to what you need. And for us, some of the, sh the, the it's, it's not for the people on the shop floor themselves, but it can be the people who support them, the process facilitators. And it's far more standardized than just Lego stones. And they don't hurt. The worst thing you can have is kids who play with Lego, leave them out in the dark. You want to walk across your child's bedroom in the night, that hurts. I don't think Mendix hurts. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. So Damo, what I really f Damo, one question. Was it the last challenge that we faced here? <laughs> or do we do some more challenges? I, I think, think so, right? <laughs> I think you'd, you'd, you'd choose some more people. I hope some of, some of the people here get to be here next year. And I hope that together we are able to inspire each other to have more stories, better stories for our people, for our customers, for our industry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So we're coming to an end, unfortunately. I really love the conversation. And what I also really love is there's so many big brands now picking up on Mindsphere. We had Volkswagen here, so there was a big press announcement. Now we have Coca-Cola. We will have Schmalz tomorrow, mm -hmm. also Bada and Demonics. So that's really like known companies mm -hmm. who finally understood that there is really value in data. But Damo, what would be your personal advice to the audience here how to get started? I think a lot of it is asking yourself the question, whether you're willing to think like a startup. Most startups go into, go into business thinking they're going to take 10 shots at it and nine of them won't work. So I think error tol tolerance 
or as you call it, the ability to learn from mistakes is going to be the most important part of, of getting into this. Okay, great. So I love this final statement from you. Thanks a lot, Damo, for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, Jana, also to you. If you are curious to hear more about Damo, Coca-Cola, and our, let's say, application development, you will find them upstairs in the Mindsphere Lounge on the first floor. There's a little area called the open space area. Damo will be with us for the rest of the day. We will be going into yeah, nice and interesting conversations. And with this, thank you very much for listening to us. Stay with us. There is more interesting stuff to come. But for the time being, thank you, Jana. Thank you, Damo. Thank you, Damo. Thank you. Siemens. Ingenuity for life.